I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by John Michael Greer, an author who writes on ecology, politics, appropriate technology, oil depletion, and the occult. John has published dozens of both books and articles, many of them on peak oil, economics, history, philosophy, and related topics. In a 2005 abstract called How Civilizations Fall, A Theory of Catabolic Collapse, he described an ecological model of collapse in which production fails to meet maintenance requirements for existing capital, which we'll be discussing today. So John, welcome, sir. Welcome. Thank you. It's a, thank you. It's a pleasure to be on. Uh, so, yeah, today we're discussing your theory of social decline called catabolic mm-hmm. collapse. You know, mm-hmm. I've read about this online and I was just enthralled with it. And I think part of it is because you have such a deep focus on economic principles, right? And, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. I mean, we, we've all heard about, like, I think the Roman Empire is probably the most popular example or the decay of the British Empire. And, mm-hmm. you know, the, no one really ever seems to address the economics underneath it. And so that's something that you dug into. And that was why I was mm-hmm. so excited when I started reading about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm wondering, could you could you start by describing what you mean by catabolic collapse and what inspired you to develop this theory? Okay. Um, I'm going to answer the first half of that or the second half of that first, actually, because the inspiration will help lead into um, what I'm talking about here. My concern in looking at um, both the predicament that we're in in as a society now and other examples of collapse in the past is that so few people had actually paid attention to the economics of the situation. You'd think that would be the obvious focus, but it's all this or it's that or it's politics or it's culture. It's all various things. Why aren't they able to pay for the upkeep of their of their civilizations? That's the big question. You know, why did Rome run out of the resources it needed to maintain its empire, to maintain its buildings, its aqueducts, and all this kind of stuff? Why are we running out of the resources that, that would be necessary to maintain our standard of living the way it was, say, 20 years ago? Um, this is, to my mind, the crucial question about um, why, how society declined. And so, yes, I approached it on an economic basis. And the, the, key, the keynote of catabolic collapse, you've actually already touched on it. It's when um, the maintenance costs, the, the amount, and not just, not just in money, please note, in goods, in services, in labor, in information, and in all the things that, go, that have to go into maintaining an economy, when you can no longer meet those costs, for whatever reason, you decline. And the reason that I refer to it as catabolic collapse, um, it's a metaphor from biology. Um, Biologists talk about anabolism as the process whereby body tissues are built up. Um, For example, when you're growing, your body goes through anabolism, you're building new tissues. And then there's also the, the flip side, which is catabolism, which is the breaking down of old tissues, the wearing away of that. That's what happens to a society in decline. It undergoes this catabolic process where it literally feeds on itself to try to maintain some of its functions when it doesn't have the resources to maintain all of them. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. And so this, again, this is another aspect of it that I really liked is um, I, I think that the way that we tend to visualize collapse, right, is this single calamitous process. And what mm-hmm. you're describing instead is a wearing away and a contraction that's a little mm-hmm. bit more normal. So well, this is why I, t- this is why I like to use the term decline partly because it rattles people. Everyone says, oh, no, we want our Hollywood collapse. I, I just watched it in the movie. No, we're looking at decline. We're looking at a process that unfolds over decades and in many cases, centuries. Go on. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, no, that makes sense. And again, I'm diverging from my questions a little bit. But, you know, again, it, one of the things that economics says is that people mm-hmm. tend to make the best decisions for themselves, right? And mm-hmm. so, you know, so yeah, in a decline situation, again, what you're describing fits seamlessly in there, right? As mm-hmm. as these costs get too high, as, you know, maintenance reserves, like, for instance, one of the things that you mentioned was uh, people had said, uh, our, our you know, great grandchildren will think thank us for all the metals that we've left on the surface, right? That's <laughs> oh yeah, that... yeah. The so skyscrapers once they turn into heaps of rust, rust is iron ore. We've dug all this stuff out of deep in the ground, refined it, and stuck it on the surface so that our great grandchildren can go chop up rusting chunks of iron and and you know take it to a blacksmith and have it hammered into plows and knives and things. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, so from reading your work, one of the things that you're basing this decline model on in our current civilization is it seems to be a decline in energy reserves or petroleum, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. most most people, I think, don't see oil as the primary issue. They they would tend to put mm -hmm. things towards a, like a decline of standard of living or mm -hmm. changing social values or so. Mm -hmm. Would you describe these as symptoms rather than causal? That's, that, that's exactly it. Um, when we look at a declining standard of living, well, why is the standard of living declining? Because we can't meet the costs to maintain it. Why can't we meet the costs to maintain it? Well, there's a wide range of reasons. The most important one is the catabolic collapse theory um, argues is that we have literally built more stuff than we can afford to maintain. We have these immense systems. We have the freeway system. We have various kinds of transport systems. We have cities. We have all of this stuff. And all of it takes maintenance. All of it requires constant inputs. And people keep on building more and more. Civilizations always do this. They keep on, whether they're building pyramids, whether they're building empires, they're building something. And they reach the point where they've outbuilt their budget. What do you do then? Um, your standard of living declines, among other things, because you can't afford to maintain all this stuff. And so stuff gets scrapped. Stuff, things get abandoned. Pyramids get, get plundered and left to be overgrown by the jungle in Central America. Outlying provinces of the empire are abandoned. Or as we see in America today, we've got um, you know, streets and cities and transportation networks that are going to bits. Why are they going to bits? Because we don't have the resources, we don't have the labor, we don't have what we would need to pay the cost of their upkeep. And so that's dragging us down. Ah, now, so you cited peak oil in 1974 mm -hmm. as, as kind of a pivotal event in this current decline. And one of the things that I'd wondered was, so mm -hmm. past peak oil, but improvements in production have kept prices down and volume up. Mm -hmm. Even if our reserves are running out, wouldn't these adequate short-term amounts prevent this kind of a decline? Okay. Now, the, first of all, 1970, the, you, you have your date a little wrong here. Oh, 1972, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, not a problem. 1972 was when the United States reached its, its then oil peak, its peak of conventional oil production. The world reached peak production in 2005. Now, that doesn't mean we're running out next Thursday. That doesn't mean we're running out this century. Um, there's a lot of oil still in the ground. The problem is this is where the, the sneaky thing gets in, and it ties into catabolic collapse. Net energy. How much energy do you have to put into drilling, extracting, refining, and so on, of the oil, compared to what you get out of it? Back in the day, back when the first wells were dug, um, you know, shallow wells, you'd go down 50 feet and hit oil. Um, there was a, you, you were getting a net energy. You were literally getting 300 barrels of oil for one barrel of oil worth of, of energy inputs. That's amazing. That's, that's like making a 300% profit on every single, you know, actually, what would it be? Three, it'd be 30,000% profit on every single transaction. You put in a buck, get 300 bucks back. That's what built the petroleum age, that fantastic energy profit. We don't do that anymore. And we don't do that anymore because we've already drilled all the shallow wells. We've already pumped dry all the shallow reserves. At this point, we're doing deep drilling, offshore drilling, fracking, anything that will get, that will get some oil out. And that costs energy. So you have to put more and more of the, of the total energy back into the production system. At this point, it's, not, it's still not bad. It's still like, uh, depending on the details, between 15 and 30 to 1. So you're still, you know, you're still putting in your $1 and getting 15 bucks back or 30 bucks back. But that's what you have to run a society on instead of 300. And so you can start seeing things get tighter. And that's the, that's the issue as we move into the future because... You know, the, the wells we're drilling now, the reserves we're pumping now, those are not going to be there in the future. We're, we're pumping them now. We're using them now to run our society. So 20 years from now, 50 years from now, we're looking at a situation where we might be getting five to one or three to one or eventually one to one, at which, at which point the whole thing becomes useless. Yeah. So that slow diminishing of net energy, or as it's called, energy return on energy invested, um, that's where peak oil becomes the problem. It's not that we run out of oil. It's that we run out of cheap oil. We run out of abundant oil. We run out of oil that gives us a lot of free energy.
Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's interesting also. And you, you, you talked about the sneaky aspect of that. Mm -hmm. Another, another thing. And again, this was in your written works that mm -hmm. you described as sneaky was oil subsidies on renewable oh, yeah. energy. And I thought okay. that was really interesting. So, and, and again, for the audience, the way that I would interpret okay. that is, is mm -hmm. it takes oil to make the wind turbines, right? Yeah. You don't make a wind turbine using wind power. Well, you can't, among other things, those fiberglass blades, that's made from petroleum. Um, all of the components are manufactured from grid power, which is mostly coming either from petroleum or from natural gas. Um, all of the construction equipment that's used to put it up is burning diesel. All of the mining equipment that's getting you the raw materials is burning diesel. So you have all of this still relatively cheap fossil fuels going in to make renewable energy look more affordable than it is. Now, please be aware, the same is true of nuclear power. The same is true of every other form of power. It's even true of coal. Nobody uses coal-fired equipment to dig coal these days. It's all being done by diesel. So it makes coal look cheaper than it is. Mm, okay, okay. So one of the large initial catabolic events that you talked about was the creation of the Rust Belt. I'm wondering, mm -hmm. could, you, could you explain that a little bit? Because Idol was understood, and it, this happened when I was, you know, baby, right? That mm -hmm. this was mm -hmm. created by the in, the introduction of inexpensive foreign steel, not necessarily energy costs. Could you, could well, you describe? No, it was, it's, it's, it's very simple. Um, in order to maintain it's the, the the U.S. in order for the U.S. to maintain the standard of living for the middle classes and up, um, we could no longer afford the energy and resource investments to maintain our own steel industry. Um, you know, steel steel is, is an energy intensive industry. You have to put a lot of energy into it, a lot of raw materials. It was cheaper to offshore. It was cheaper to shut down our plants and start buying things from plants in Japan or China or in various other corners of the world. Now, of course, that basically flushed the lives of America's working class down the Oak Road. But to try to maintain, um, to, to maintain, again, middle class and upper class standards of living, that was a great example of catabolic collapse. We catabolized our own industrial system. The, the industrial hinterlands that won the Second World War, the industrial hinterlands that made the United States the world's great industrial power in the mid-20th century, was scrapped because it was, no longer, it was no longer cost effective to maintain it. We no longer had the resources, the money, and so on to maintain it and still maintain standards of living for the middle and upper classes. So, whoosh, away it went. Um, we, up until that time, tariffs had maintained the U.S. industry. We ditched the tariffs. We went hardcore into free trade, which simply means that we ship out money and um, other people do all the work. Um, and yeah, so that's, it's actually, that was actually a very important bit of catabolism. And if you study it with that in mind, you can see some of the ways the catabolic collapse takes place. Mm, okay. Okay. I, I, again, I think this is one of the things that makes this model so profound is that you're, you're taking this big, scary idea of collapse or big, depressing idea of decline, and you're actually putting it in terms that make sense. And so pick it apart, know, figure out what the individual steps down the down the stair are. And then yeah, you can understand it. and You can understand what to do about it. Go yeah. on. Well, so one of the important aspects that really impressed me is it, it, about breaking collapse down is it goes into a series of crisis events followed by stable periods as science mm -hmm. as society cannibalizes itself and then uses those resources to temporarily mm -hmm. stabilize right life mm -hmm. could this could this explain our current series of recessions and periods relative economic stability in the u.s right now Ding! we have a winner yes that's in fact exactly what's been going on. We have been going through a sequence of catabolic crises since the early 1970s. We had the big catabolic crisis of the, the energy crises of the 70s, the beginning of the Rust Belt, the scrapping of our industry, and that won, earned a, basically a won us some time. That gave us a stable period through the 1980s and, and the 1990s. Then we had the big tech stock crash and a whole range of other economic crises in the late 1990s and the beginning of the 21st century. And then, you know, and then that we, you know, things went crazy for a while. Then we had another, and but they stabilized. Then we hit um, 2008, 2009. We had the housing crisis. We had the oil spike of that that period. Another round of catabolism. More people driven into poverty. More resources um, basically stripped to 
try to maintain the system. We're probably moving into another crisis right now. Yeah, I, actually, I was going to ask about that. So based on this model of periodic crisis mm -hmm. events, uh, mm -hmm. what do you anticipate seeing happen next? And how do you think it'll impact us? How, how will we probably cannibalize our way out of it this time? Well, it's, it's it's really a guess. It's really it's you know because all of these are all of these these social events, all these historical events are a matter of millions of people making their own best guess as to the right decisions for themselves. That's very hard to predict. My working guess, however, given the way we've backed ourselves into a series of corners, is that we're going to see um, an, a very serious recession in in the not too distant future, within the next few years. Um, probably what we're going to have to discard at this point is the U.S. dollar's role as the primary, as the, the world's reserve currency. We can no longer keep on importing stuff from everywhere in the world because we're just paying for it with unpayable IOUs. The dollar is, is, is struggling right now as um, hostile nations are increasingly de-dollarizing. So we're going to lose a lot of ground there. We're going to lose a lot of access to foreign uh, resources, a lot of access to foreign energy. And um, yeah, there are going to be some changes. The fact that we're already starting to see some of our large cities hollowing out, people bailing out of New York, bailing out of Chicago, bailing out of Los Angeles. There's the writing on the wall. People are moving to smaller cities and to other parts of the country that don't have that same burden of, um, of, of capital that cannot be maintained. And so I would expect to see some of the cities basically um, undergo a fair amount of catabolic collapse. Yeah, yeah. Well, so over this prolonged period of decay, and again, this mm -hmm. is one of the keys to your model: is this mm -hmm. this doesn't happen overnight, right? It doesn't happen overnight. Right. It's not a Hollywood spectacular. It's that grueling day by day process of looking at your paycheck and saying, "Ooh, this yes. does not pay as much as it did." <clears throat> so, yes. What, what, how do you see this affecting the U.S. government? Will it fragment along state lines? And, and the reason I ask that is mm -hmm. um, the recent marijuana legislation mm -hmm. where several states started to progressively go against the federal government. To mm -hmm. me, that seemed like maybe there was some fragmentation beginning to occur. Do you think oh, that yeah. might? Oh, yeah. At this point, what is it? 19 states have called for a constitutional convention that would um, yank the chain of the federal government good and hard, transfer a bunch of power to the states. All it takes is, what is it, 34 states? So they're, they're like halfway. They're more than halfway there. And I expect to see things like that happening. The United States became a, a hyper-centralized empire, basically, when we went into the global, the global hegemon business, when we went into running, trying to run the world. That's, um, that's a strategy with a, with a limited shelf life. Sooner or later, again, empires no longer pay for themselves. You have the problem with, with excess capital there, too. That's what happened to the British Empire. It's happening to ours right now. And so I would expect to see as the as um, America's foreign foreign empire breaks down, um, I would expect to see a lot of power being yanked back by the states. I am hoping I, th I think, you know, I think the idea of having, you know, one nation under God and all that kind of stuff is a good idea. And I think if we can go back to a more federalist system where states handle all of their most of their own internal affairs, and the federal government is there just for the things enumerated in the Constitution, um, you know, national defense, interstate trade, and so on, um, I think that could work very well, um, possibly for several downward rounds, and it would provide a lot of benefits. But we'll see what happens. Ah, the possibility okay. the possibility that the US could literally split apart is a real one. It would not take a civil war. All it would take is a constitutional convention to pass a you know, a law allowing states to leave. And if that happened, I think a bunch of them would. Well, and again, I, actually, you just touched on my next question, which was mm -hmm. in terms of fragmentation. I, I don't mm -hmm. think anybody's going to dispute that we've seen a major increase in the liberal conservative divide over the last mm -hmm. few decades. So, mm -hmm. it, it, and I know I realize that's probably symptomatic of catabolic mm -hmm. collapse, but do you think that we'll see more of that or? or... Well, it's, uh, there, the problem is that p it, the media likes to flatten it out into liberal and conservative. There's actually a much wider range of fragmentation going on because what counts as liberal and conservative in Texas is not what counts as liberal as a liberal and conservative here in Rhode Island, let me tell you. And so there are there are actually quite a number, probably half a dozen 
different sets of viewpoints that are taking shape. And so you have, you know, within on, on the sort of general left, you have the sort of mainstream corporate left. On the one hand, you have the ecological left, you have the radical socialist left and so on. And these do not necessarily get along with each other. Similarly, on the right, you have the corporate right, you have the populist right, you have the religious right. These are not necessarily allies. I expect to see a lot of strange realignments as this picks up as more and more people realize that flattening it out into a two-way system where it's just liberal and conservative doesn't actually make that much sense. And you, I mean, I have been, I've been watching um, some very unusual connections being made in American politics. You're walking, you know, we're watching people in the gay and lesbian community who are increasingly making common cause with people on the right because of some of the issues involved with the whole transgender movement and so on. Um, we're watching situations where people in the populist right are making common cause with some of the people on the radical left because they actually have it. They have a shared distrust of centralization and, and of the corporate system that, that runs our lives. And so there's the, it really is up in the air. There's a lot of division going on, a lot of reshuffling, and it'll be interesting to see where all that ends up. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it's... It... It, it, there's there are so many moving pieces a, again in that mm -hmm. economics model it's people making individual good decisions exactly. for themselves right exactly well, people looking at the situation and saying okay forget about what the television says what actually makes sense to me yeah and there we go so one of the things i wanted to ask about was can catabolic collapse happen in one society while growth happens in another and and the the idea that kind of came I, I was thinking about the British Empire. America grew mm -hmm. while they were in decline. And oh, yeah. now that manufacturing is shifting towards China and the Asian Pacific mm -hmm. region, it mm -hmm. seems like their cultures are on the way up and, and then ours seems to be in decline. Is, is that, it, it's not, a, again, it's not a single process for everyone, right? No, or, it's a, it doesn't. No, there's, the, there is a broad overall process that, is, that ties into the global extraction of fossil fuels. That because that gave fossil fuels gave the world an enormous supply of cheap energy. As that peaks and declines, you're going to see a lot of changes all over the world. But yeah, diff the thing is, what what happened in what's happened in the world history in in the history of the world in recent times has been very unusual. We had for a period of about 400 years, Europe, which is just this little rocky peninsula sticking off the west end of Asia. It's it's a podunk. It's in the middle of nowhere, and has been for most of human history. But they got they got their hands on the industrial revolution first they figured out how to use coal they figured out several other things they conquered the world <laughs> seriously in in 1850 and 1900 most of the world's surface was either ruled for a european capital or it was ruled by uh, people who had emigrated from europe as in you know latin america and, and all through the americas and then that's been breaking down as that breaks down you're starting to see some of the some of the parts of the world that were shoved down by by the age of European empire rising again. China is one of them. India is one of them. India was the richest country in the world in 1600. It was the poorest country in the world in in 1900 because the British robbed it blind. They took everything that wasn't nailed down. But now India is having a chance to recover. It's starting to stretch its muscles again. It's become. I mean, it's developed its nuclear power. It's developing a blue water navy. They're on their way up. China's on their way up. Watching how those two are going to get along is complicated. Um, I would expect to see um, several parts of Africa and several parts of Latin America picking up while we're skidding down. That's the way history normally goes. Okay. Okay. So one of the other things that I thought it would be really interesting to touch on is this global demographic transition that's underway. Mm -hmm. And I guess the prediction is that world population levels are going to start falling below replacement levels. Africa is an exception to that. But for the rest of the world, um, as industrialization and education and all of those things that go with mm -hmm. or at least past higher standard of living, you know, as those begin to affect things, there could be up to a natural 10x reduction in global population over the next 100 to 200 years. Well, it'll be more than that. Could, could that on. help to offset decline from catabolic collapse? No, it's a normal part of decline. 
Um, my view of the whole demographic transition is that there's actually something much more complex going on here. Oh. Um, we have seen in the Middle East, in Latin America, in several other parts of the world that have not really industrialized at all. Um, they've still gone through that steep decrease in population. This is normal when resources run short. People have fewer kids. It's just is a normal part of history. If you read writings from the late Roman Empire, one of the things they constantly talk about is depopulation. There's so many fewer people. People, are, women are not having children anymore. Um, it's a normal part of the downward cycle. If we follow the usual curve, we'll bottom out about five percent. So about a tw- about about a one twentieth of, of uh, peak global population, and we could be at the peak right now. Nobody really knows yet. Um, that's normal. That's probably two, three hundred years from now. Um, the thing is, decli- a declining population is a real challenge because, among other things, your workforce shrinks faster than your retirement class. You wonder why we have so many old people working in Walmarts and things like that. It's because we can no longer support the the capital, if you will. We, we you know, that's our catabolic collapse. We can no longer pay for all these people to just sit on the beach all day. Okay. And so okay. pensions are dropping and everything else, that things are just sort of shrinking down and, you know, people in their 80s are going to work as Walmart greeters because they have to, because the workforce is beginning to dwindle, but it's dwindling faster than the retirement community. Well, so John, I, I was going to ask if the free market system is the best model to naturally accommodate the contraction, but it sounds like it's the model that always kind of takes effect, I guess. Yeah, without... it, it probably, it, it may well not be the best in some sense, but it's the way it always ends up working out. <laughs> um, and now, the thing is, free market, that, that's always a very complex turn of phrase. I think Adam Smith, the guy who invented capitalism in The Wealth of Nations, pointed out that the free market only remains free for about 15 minutes at a time because people in business always get together to rig prices. You always have all of these pressures pulling the free market one way or the other, and they don't always balance out. You always have people trying to uh, work connections with government to get monopolies and things like that. But ultimately, the further you stray from market forces, the further unbalanced you get, the more things start falling to bits. Ultimately, those are another part of the capital that you can't maintain, and you end up with you know the kind of free market where people are bartering um, you know turnips for for fish. Yeah, absolutely. Well, John, let me thank you again for your time today. It has been an You're honor welcome. to talk with you about this. Again, it, it it just fits. This is the first description of social decline for me that I've read that just seems to fit. Thank um, you. So I appreciate that. Let me close by asking, what comes next for you? And where can we expect to see validation for catabolic collapse in tomorrow's um, headlines? What comes next for me? Well, I'm, I'm a writer by trade. I'm always writing something. I've... Um, I've been blogging, I've recently been blogging again about energy and economic, energy issues and, and decline because we're so obviously in the middle of that. And that may turn into a book someday, but I have a range of interests, including fiction. And so I'm always writing new things. In terms of validation, the problem with any long-term theory of decline is that none of us will be around to watch the whole thing. I mean, 300 years from now, somebody can pick up a battered copy of my essay on catabolic collapse and look over, hmm, yes, this is how the ancient American empire fell. And yes, that fits or not. You know, they can look and say, no, that model didn't work. Um, but I'm not there. Yeah. <laughs> and so the thing that I would point to, however, is um, I would encourage people who are trying to get a sense of its potential validity Watch um, the contraction in actual standards of living, not what's on paper, not the official government propaganda, excuse me, statistics, um, or any of this stuff. But look at your own life. Look at how far does your paycheck go? The quality of goods that you receive, have they, are they the same as they were? Are they improved? Are they worse? Et cetera, et cetera. What is actually happening around you? That's your best measure. And if you notice that sort of stair-step decline process, then you know, catabolic collapse offers a model for making sense of it. Okay. John, again, thank you so much, sir. It has been truly a pleasure and an honor. Thank you very much for having me on. I've enjoyed our conversation.